This is Law Bites, a podcast with Michael Geist. Now, pursuant to the order of reference adopted by the House on Tuesday, May the 31st, 2022, and the motion adopted by the committee on Tuesday, September the 20th, 2022, the committee is meeting on the study of Bill C-18, an act respecting online communications platforms that make news content available to persons in Canada. Since its introduction in early April, the Online News Act, also known as Bill C-18, has largely flown below the public's radar screen. There's been a few op-eds, considerable coverage on my blog, and I've hosted a couple of podcasts on point, one with former CBC executive Sue Gardner and the other with independent digital media publishers Farhan Mohammed and Jeff Elgey. If you're interested in the bill, both episodes provide important insights into both the legislation and the realities of the news business today. Now, despite its importance and some concerns about specific provisions in the bill, Canadian Heritage Minister Pablo Rodriguez has largely been content to rush Bill C-18 through the parliamentary process with little debate. He actually has never given a speech on the bill in the House of Commons, and the government successfully cut off debate after allocating just two hours to it. Now, late last month, Bill C-18 headed to the Standing Committee on Canadian Heritage for hearings that after two sessions, it must be said, had the distinct feeling of Bill C-11 all over again. The Liberals and NDP demonstrated little interest in delving into the bill's fine print as they primarily look for broadly supportive comments. The Bloc focus on Quebec-based witnesses who say much the same thing which leaves only the Conservative MPs to poke holes in the bill with witnesses raising concerns. At this stage, there are actually no further hearings that are scheduled, though more may be added later in October. I was one of the witnesses that appeared during the committee's first hearing on the bill. While I experienced some technical challenges, I was still able to raise specific concerns in an effort to make the case that the bill is a bad solution to what is a real problem. I've been running a blog series with the same name. It's touched on issues such as the risk to free flow of information online, the remarkable level of government intervention, and the risks of breaching international treaty and trade obligations. That blog series will continue in the coming days. But in the meantime, this week's podcast touches on some of those same issues with audio clips from my committee appearance, including the substantive part of my opening statement and exchanges with various MPs. Now, before jumping into the opening statement clip, it's worth emphasizing that few dispute the importance of a robust, diverse media sector and the challenge it's faced in recent years in adjusting to far greater competition. Now, that's come from both local services, including dozens of new digital-first organizations that have popped up in recent years, as well as foreign services, such as the New York Times, Washington Post, and many others that actively compete for Canadian subscribers. Changing market dynamics have obviously also changed the digital ad market, with more money moving towards companies such as Google, Facebook, and Amazon. That shift has little to do with the availability of links to news stories, but rather is largely the result of a combination of a better ad model, with more precise information and targeting, coming from the large digital players, and advertisers who are moving with their audience. Indeed, the emergence of Amazon is the third largest digital ad platform, and the growth of others, which could soon include Netflix, highlight the tenuous connection between news and digital ad trends. Yet given the importance of the sector and the challenges of economic transition, there are reasons to be supportive of the government's efforts to support the sector. Several years ago, the sector lobbied heavily for government support, and it got it, with hundreds of millions in tax dollars poured into programs and tax breaks. The programs that have been introduced, including the Local Journalism Initiative, the Journalism Labor Tax Credit, and the Digital News Subscription Tax Credit, offer some hope, provided they maintain a neutral, transparent implementation that doesn't favor legacy companies over new, innovative services. I have to say transparency thus far has largely been a failure that requires real action, but it's still relatively early in the process. And I think that government should have been content to allow those programs to play out 
and judged the need for further measures afterward. But it's fair to say that it wasn't content with just sticking with those programs. Rather than focus on programs that have offered hundreds of millions in support, the government turned instead to the Rupert Murdoch-inspired Australian model to force payment from Internet platforms based on the argument that there should be fair compensation for the use of journalist content. And while there might indeed be support for a bill that did that, the reality of Bill C-18 is far different. Basic principle of the bill is simple. Encourage large digital platforms to negotiate payments with news organizations for using news with the prospect of mandated arbitration overseen by the CRTC should they fail to reach an agreement. Now, leaving aside the fact that most major Canadian media organizations already have deals with these companies for actual use, the bill stretches the meaning of use far beyond a reasonable standard, creating serious risks of setting precedents for payments merely for linking to content and placing the free flow of information online at risk. Throw in a bill that's likely to be challenged on multiple trade and treaty grounds, opens the door to funding for giants such as Bell and the public broadcaster, the CBC, and leaves the CRTC in charge of a myriad of major issues, and the Online News Act becomes a bill that is a bad solution to a real problem. As I noted, I faced some technical hiccups in this committee appearance, so I'll start with my opening statement as it began to examine four key substantive points. First, my concern is the approach to the use of news in news articles extends far beyond what a reasonable person would consider use. Section 2 sub 2 covers both reproduction of any portion of a news article and facilitating access to news by any means. First part means that even reproducing a news headline or sentence summary is covered, even though that form of use is freely permitted by copyright quotation rights under the Berne Convention. The second part means that linking or indexing to the front page of a news site, not even to an article, is treated as compensable activity. That just can't be right. Treating mere linking as a thing of value requiring compensation runs counter to Supreme Court jurisprudence on the importance of linking and threatens the lifeblood of the free flow of information on the Internet. If Google or Facebook copied and distributed full articles, I could under, understand the arguments around compensation. Indeed, those companies have struck deals in Canada to pay for exactly that. But when Dr. Fry posts a link on her Facebook to an MSN.ca article, or Mr. Julian posts a link on his Facebook to a Canadian press article, as they did this summer like millions of other Canadians, I don't think we are anywhere near a making available news standard that should require compensation. Second, the government has claimed the bill involves minimal market intervention, yet the reality is that there are an astonishing numbers of standards and bargaining rules established by the government or the CRTC in the bill, which has a real-world impact with, on government interference blurring the news editorial and business divides. Third, at a time when there are rightly concerns about misinformation and low-quality news sources, Bill C-18 risks increased misinformation. For example, the definition of news content contains no standards or links to professional journalism. Instead, the definition, which I should note is different in the English and French language versions of the bill, could incorporate blog posts, opinion pieces, and other content. The government's approach on qualified Canadian journalism organizations has detailed guidance on what constitutes news to ensure that tax breaks go to high-quality original journalism. Bill C-18 does the opposite. Moreover, the bill creates potential liability for platforms that use algorithms to demote content. To be clear, we need greater algorithmic transparency, but the provision on undue preferences may mean that platforms refrain from demoting low-quality journalism for fear of liability. Fourth, the bill is offside several treaty and constitutional obligations. For example, Section 24, which excludes copyright limitations and exceptions from the bargaining process, may violate Article 10 sub 1 of the Berne Convention, which has a mandatory right of quotation that expressly includes newspaper articles. Further, the bill is filled with potential Kuzma challenges. For example, Section 51 of the bill features what amounts to a must-carry obligation designed to prevent a platform from refusing to link to third-party content. 
while self-dealing measures targeting anti-competitive conduct by the platforms is welcome. 30 seconds. These provisions go beyond that and are vulnerable under Kuzma's performance requirements under 14.10. With regard to constitutional concerns, the bill isn't broadcast, it isn't telecommunications, and it's not copyright. How then does it fit within federal powers? The government claims powers over anything involving the internet. There are no real limits on jurisdiction. And as for the charter statement, it inaccurately claims that the bill supports news organizations when the internet platforms monetize their content, even though that's not what the bill says or provides. I thank you for your patience with the technical problems, and I look forward to your questions. Conservative MP John Nader was first up with questions, asking me to expand on the concerns involving the risks with the definition of use of news content. I want to start with a couple of questions to uh, Dr. Geist, as well as to Ms. Gerson. Um, both of you mentioned in your uh, your opening statements the idea of the value proposition or or, or where the uh, the intrinsic uh, value uh, comes from. I know, uh, Dr. Geist, you talked about the difference between uh, reproduction versus uh, facilitating uh, access. Um, both of you, uh, you know, made made various commentary uh, related to that kind of side of things. So I want to start with the uh, you know Professor Geist. Could you expand on that a little bit uh, in terms of where this uh, this bill may be uh, going down, uh, perhaps a, a slightly um, uh, a skewed path in terms of uh, of uh, where the funding will be directed to? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question. So I think we've heard several witnesses emphasize that. You know, they, they, their their materials, their work, their news content is being used, and they should be compensated for that. Now, if this was used in the way that I think most Canadians would consider use, Google or Facebook or whomever, is copying their articles, reproducing them, running ads against them, one can well understand why that would be the conclusion. But the definition that is used in this legislation goes far, far beyond that. It speaks merely to facilitating access to news, putting it in an index with even just a portion of a work. And so if you link to the front page of the Globe and Mail or the National Post or the Toronto Star, which has some articles there, that's facilitating access to news. If you've got merely a link to it uploaded by a member of this committee or myself or someone else, that link is considered facilitating access to news. I don't think that's use in the way that people would think of it. And when we say that publishers aren't being paid fairly, that's the kind of thing that they shouldn't be paid for. It's There's no copyrights in it. It's not being used in a way. And so if we're talking about compensating for use, the legislation ought to reflect that. And I don't believe the definition that we have comes anywhere near close to doing that. I want to carry on with uh, with a couple of questions. Um, under this bill, it it, uh, it envisions that the CBC, the national broadcaster, would be uh, would be included in it. Um, I find it interestingly as well. You know, this uh, this program will be uh, administered um, by the CRTC, which uh, just last week the uh, the government, the government and governor and council sent back the CBC's uh, license renewal to the CRTC. So uh, interesting, the government doesn't uh, doesn't uh, agree with the CRTC's decision on that, but then is also at the same time um, putting the CRTC in charge of it. So uh, perhaps I'll start with uh, Professor Geis and I'll see how much time I have uh, left. But uh, what are your thoughts on, on You have a, 57 seconds. 57 seconds, lots of time. Uh, a, uh, the inclusion of the public broadcaster uh, within this, uh, but also uh, B, uh, the CRTC as the uh, as the one to uh, administer it. So I'll start with Professor Geis and uh, perhaps uh, Ms. Gerson would have a, a couple minutes or a couple seconds as well. Okay, I'll try to go quickly. I'll start with the CRTC by saying that I don't think this is the CRTC's bailiwick in terms of the role that it plays. It sets an enormous number of standards, and I think there's reason for concern for that role. I think, frankly, more broadly, the inclusion of broadcasters here is problematic. Frankly, there is another example, actually, of uh, different definitions in the English language version of the bill and the French language bill with respect to broadcasting. So it's something the committee should take a look at. But beyond that, if you talk to a lot of the the local digital first operators, they will tell you the CBC is a competitor of theirs in those local communities. And to provide them with additional revenue effectively forces their hand. Even if those small and independent players don't want the money, they've got little choice but to participate in this system. It's basically forced negotiation for those kinds of companies too. After some witnesses claim that the bill is designed to save journalism, MP Rachel Thomas asked for my thoughts on the connection between Bill C-18 and journalism and journalists. Dr. Geist, I'm I'm just noting here around the table, Mr. Sims has said that Bill C-18 is about protecting journalism. 
Others at the table have said that it's about protecting democracy. I'm just wondering if you care to comment based on your expertise. Yeah, thank you for that. <clears throat> I would say this, listen, if this was a bill about journalism, I think there'd be a lot more support for it. We should be clear, it's not. It mentions the word journalism once with respect to qualified journalism organizations. It has three sections that mention journalists. It's not about journalism or journalists. It's about uh, funding some of these legacy media organizations. In fact, there are no standards with respect to journalism at all. And you need to contrast that with what the government has approved with QCGOs, the Qualified uh, Canadian Journalism Organizations, which sets a wide range of standards to ensure what you are producing and incentivizing the production of is high quality journalism. There is none of that in this legislation. And so with the low standards of allowing entry into uh, to qualify for this, what you are effectively doing is incentivizing clickbait, low quality journalism that people will get paid on the basis of clicks because they can demand to be part of this table through the collective bargaining, as you just heard. And when we look to platforms to try to meet that out, to use the algorithms to prioritize the high quality journalism and demote the low quality journalism, legislation hits you again creating potential liability where they demote that. And so the danger here is that we are not going to be supporting high quality journalism. We'll be supporting some legacy companies to be sure. But if this was really about journalism, one would have thought you'd actually mentioned it in the bill more than a couple of times. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Dr. Geis. I, I just want to expand on that or take it in a slightly different direction, but I think it also has to do with that. And that is, you know, one of the things that you've pointed out as well is the lack of clarity in terms of terms used within this bill. For example, news content. Um, you've gone on to question whether or not Bill C-18 is even constitutional. So I'm wondering what, what impact would this lack of clarity have and why do you think we're in this situation? We've, we've been here before. We've seen this with other bills where, you know, the Liberal government has just said, Trust us. Trust us. Just trust us. Um, so just wondering if you care to comment on that. Sure. So there are problems even within the bill. I've already noted there are at least a couple of examples, and there may well be others where the English version and the French version don't align, creating potential confusion as to what actually is intended by the government as part of this bill. But beyond that, it is vulnerable with respect to our agreement with the United States quite clearly. It is vulnerable with respect to our international obligations under copyright. I must say, I find it astonishing that we would effectively say that uh, certain parties don't have rights of quotation. Effectively, mm -hmm. you have to set it aside for the purposes of negotiation. This is a must have within international copyright law. And yet that's been excluded. I should note that is something that you do not find in the Australian legislation. That's a made in Canada mm -hmm. violation of the internet of international law. And then from a constitutional perspective, I struggle to see how this even fits within traditional powers of the federal government. Because as I say, not broadcast, not telecom, not copyright. News isn't something that is traditionally within that purview. So what's the likely outcome of this? There is no question but that this will be challenged on a number of different levels. And so the idea that this will result in fast agreements and fast payouts strike me as exceptionally unlikely. MP Kevin Waugh was focused on some of the uncertainties associated with the bill, asking for clarification about the likely funding. The other question I got, Mr. Geist, is simply, can you tell me or can somebody on this tell me what the Mooseman World Spectator were told this is going to be worth a lot of money to local independent owners? What can the owner of the Mooseman World Spectator expect from this deal? Is it 5000 a year? Is it 10000 a year? Is it $100,000 a year? If he's got two employees in the newsroom, he's eligible. I have not heard a figure that I can take back to an independent owner in this country to say it's good. I, yeah, sure, it's good. I'm getting 5000 extra dollars. I need the figure, the exact figure that will be negotiated to the lower and medium cities, newspapers. Can someone tell me on this panel what they can expect? I've heard outrageous numbers. And I need to know exactly the number that they can expect. Anybody on this panel want to take a shot at that? Mr. Geis. Okay, I'll start. Thank you, Mr. Watt. I, I don't think anybody can give you an exact number because I don't think anybody knows at this stage. And we certainly don't know what people are getting in Australia either. 
Uh, Mr. Sims might, but the public generally doesn't know any of this kind of information. So there's a great deal of secrecy associated with that system, at least in terms of what's available publicly. We don't know, but here's the two things we do know. One, we know that these businesses will effectively be forced to participate in this. Why? Because their competitors, like, as you mentioned, the CBC and others are in. So you can't compete effectively. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of smaller independent media organizations, oftentimes digital first in local communities, they're oftentimes thriving and they're going to struggle uh, to not participate because they're competing against those that are taking the cash. Let me also very quickly, and then I see Ms. Gerson has a comment, very quickly note just uh, for Mr. Deegan, if he would continue with Section 27 one sub a it does mention qcgos and then there's an important word it's or and the or gives you sub b which sets a low standard for accessibility to this program in which there are simply no standards that's the law bites podcast for this week if you have comments suggestions or other feedback write to lawbites at pobox.com follow the podcast on twitter at Law Bites Pod or Michael Geist at M Geist. You can download the latest episodes from my website at michaelgeist.ca or subscribe via RSS at Apple Podcast, Google, or Spotify. The Law Bites Podcast is produced by Gerardo LeBron LeBoy. Music by the LeBoy Brothers, Gerardo and Jose LeBron LeBoy. Credit information for the clips featured in this podcast can be found in the show notes for this episode at michaelgeist.ca. I'm Michael Geist. Thanks for listening and see you next time.